Thank you, Samantha, for this very kind introduction. Now I got some pressure for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, I also got pressure because I'm sharing this stage with these huge and great experts, these huge names. Uh, and I'm everything but a professional speaker. I'm professional at playing ball. I'm, I'm a professional tennis player. And the biggest crowd I ever had of one of my matches since I'm in a wheelchair was maybe 100 people, but definitely not a crowd like this. So this is a very unusual situation for me as well. So since this is such an unusual thing for me to do, I was thinking, why shouldn't I make this whole talk an unusual thing? Because let me tell you one thing in the beginning. This is probably not going to be the way you expected it to be. I will not be your cliche inspiration guy today. I will not be sitting up here playing the wheelchair card, telling you heartfelt stories about how hard my life has been. I'll also not tell you how I overcame the fact that I will be in a wheelchair for all my life, because I know that I will be, and I'm pretty OK with it. You see, um, I'm in a wheelchair already since I was two years old, after a car accident. I grew up on wheels. I don't know life any other way. So um, I didn't see any difference, which doesn't mean that I didn't have to face any obstacles in my past. Trust me, due to my disability, there were loads. But I think everyone has to face obstacles in his, in his life. And mine probably are just a bit more obvious than others but we all have to overcome them the same. So this is what I will talk about in these next 20 minutes, uh, how to overcome obstacles, how to find solutions for your problems. But I'm not the person who will share some general wisdom with you, uh, because I think I'm hardly wise enough to be, to be that person. I mean, after all, I'm 22 years old. No, instead, I will just tell you stories, stories of my life, stories of problems I had to face, I overcame. And I present you my solutions. And maybe you find some of them helpful for yourselves, for your problems as well. Growing up in a wheelchair, I found there is three different kinds of problems you have to face. One are the obvious physical problems. The second are problems in society, or better, within society. And the third are problems with yourself, personal problems you have to face. After an accident, obviously the physical ones, the Physical challenges are the first ones to overcome. Uh, normally, the procedure is that you go into a re rehabilitation center. You're being given all the tools you need to come back to your life. You learn how to use a wheelchair. You learn how to transfer from a wheelchair to bed, to a car, how to use an accessible toilet. In general, how to live your everyday, everyday life again. But as I told you, I was just two years old when I had my accident, and back then, all the rehabilitation centers in Austria, they told me, we can't take you. You're too small. Quote of a doctor back then was, having a disability or a spinal cord injury at your age is inconvenient, but there's nothing we can do. Um, so we had a pretty huge problem to solve back then. And I was just two years old, so the credit for the problem solution isn't mine. It is my parents, because they were the ones saying that uh, they won't give up. They will find a solution, and they found one in Russia. Uh, we went to a clinic which was willing to take me, not because they had facilities for smaller children. They just didn't care how old you were, because they treated everyone the same anyways. <laughs> and it was a very Russian way, because they had this very specific uh, mindset and philosophy they followed, which was not to make your life accessible, which was not to make your life comfortable, but to have as many barriers in your life as possible so that you learn how to overcome them. For example, when I was uh, there for nearly seven to eight months, I wasn't allowed to use a wheelchair there. I had to learn how to get from one place to another uh, without it. So we implemented these same rules back home in Vienna uh, until I was 12 years old. My mom in my apartment never had to use the vacuum cleaner because I was crawling all over the place. And, um, also, when I wanted to steal some candy, as all of us did, uh, I found solutions. I just, the candy obviously was situated in the top shelf in the kitchen, so I just took a chair, pushed it to the stove, lifted myself onto the chair, from there onto the stove, which was, of course, turned off, and 
Then after some gymnastic exercises, I managed to get some forbidden chocolate as well. <laughs> so I was pretty sporty back then already. So um, some of you might think not letting your disabled, chair, disabled child use a wheelchair sounds a bit cruel, doesn't it? But I'm really grateful and thankful for that because like that, I learned uh, that I'm not dependent or determined by my wheelchair. I'm not chained to it, but I'm just an independent person using a wheelchair as a tool, which is a very good mindset for the situation, I think. I might have faced a harder challenge than most people in my situation, but I grew with it and so did my self-confidence. Because, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I grew with it. Uh, so I was not afraid to join my friends at the soccer field, for example. I was, we, we had stories when we like broke into some courts, uh, some, some soccer fields at night, we just reassembled, like we di disassembled the chair, threw the parts over the fence, I crawled underneath the fence onto the field, we reassembled the chair, off we went. Uh, I was mostly a defender, because my only purpose in this game was to charge at full speed at the striker whenever he had, he had the ball. Uh, and eventually run him over. So I was a very feared player back then. <laughs> but I was very efficient, and everyone begged me to be on his team. And the same story was how I started to play tennis, because uh, my family has always been a tennis family. They always played when we were on vacation, and I was around seven or six years old. I just grabbed a racket, joined them on the court, and said, give me some balls as well. I didn't hit any one of them, still had huge fun already back then. So I continued and started hitting most of them. So the point of these stories are that when I grew up, I didn't see any difference between me and other non-disabled children. I, was just, I saw myself as a normal kid, having the same dreams, playing the same games. Uh, I just did the normal stuff. But not everyone, obviously, saw me that way. And now we come to the second group of problems you have to face growing up with a disability. It is problem within society, or better, problems with other people's opinion. Because when I was six years old, ready to go to school, uh, my being the annoying little brother I was, I wanted to go to the same school as my brother did. And he was two years older than me, so when he came to school, my mom already arranged with the headmaster that it's going to be no problem for me to join it as well. And it's all fixed. She ensured it to us. But then when the registration deadline has ended for, for my school year, she called my mom saying, like, well, something happened. There was now enough normal kids who entered the school, so we don't need your wheelchair kid anymore. <laughs> so we had to search for another school. And that was the first time that I experienced that I was not able to do something everyone else did because of my disability or because of something different. I was questioning, am I not normal? Uh, I mean, I cannot blame the principal because of, I think it was just fear of contact with disabled people because you have to keep in mind, in everyday life, you hardly get in touch with disabled people. If you get information about them, you get them via the media, which, especially in the past, didn't draw the most positive view or the most positive picture of people with disabilities. So it's understandable that people don't see us as normal people who just have another way of getting from one place to another or just have another way of getting things done. They see us as people who can't make anything on themselves because all we ever got was pity. So I'm actually really thankful for 15 seconds for giving me the stage today, for giving a lot of people maybe a more positive view on life with disability, or maybe life even in general. Uh, so people won't continue pitying us, but eventually include us. Um, so I actually got a fun story and a fun example on the amount of pity you get that can be absurd, because you have to remember uh, when I was like six, seven years old, rolling around Vienna in my mini wheelchair, I was probably uh, an eye catcher, I guess, because that's not really common. So it didn't happen rarely that when I was, for example, in a cafe with my mom, uh, that total strangers walked up to us and were just handing me money. 
just like that. <laughs> because they associated in their head, they associated a wheelchair immediately with being in need of money and being poor. And back then, I was incredibly happy. I was, afford, I was able to afford the next Lego kit, some more candy. I didn't question it. But now, in retrospective, I'm a bit more like, what? <laughs> I mean, if people ask me how to not treat disabled people, having, just giving them money for free <laughs> is definitely on the list. <laughs> so yeah, I'm talking about uh, finding solutions today. But sometimes, there are situations where it's difficult to find solutions. Uh, I can tell you, for example, when puberty hits, there's little you can do. So now we come to the third and probably most interesting part of finding solutions, is finding solutions for problems with yourself. And during puberty, it was for me the first time that you actually start thinking. I guess most of you have experienced something similar. And I had to think about the fact that I'm disabled for the first time as well. Uh, I had to think about how I was going to handle the fact and who I want to be in the future. Because uh, my parents had a pretty clear idea of who I should become in the future. I was to become the guy who will walk again. And I think this is very understandable. I mean, imagine being told that your little two-year-old uh, will never walk again in his life. He still very cute, couldn't even talk back then. And my parents were born in the 60s, where people had no idea that someone with a disability could turn out so cool. So uh, <laughs> of course, you want to undo the damage. And that's why my childhood, I had lots of treatments every day. I was ex investing lots of, uh, lots of energy, lots of time in this goal to walk again. But then I decided something. OK, sorry. <laughs> uh, but then during puberty, I decided something very specific, that I don't want to walk again. Uh, well, I guess this is a pretty interesting thought. And mo most of you probably cannot share this belief. But I think for me, it is very clear. Because back then in puberty, I started questioning myself. Uh, why would I even want to walk again? I mean, where would the difference be in my life? Would it, would it even be any better? I think I'd be, either way, I would have been a student. I would have had the same friends, would have played the same games, would have had the same ambitions. Uh, I think even my quality in life wouldn't have changed. I hope that people don't measure their quality of life on whether they can climb stairs or not but on greater things. So I don't want to walk again. And I also don't want to chase a goal which was not making me any happier, which I figured out, but actually just kept me frustrated every day because I was failing every day. I was not walking every day. I mean, after all, spinal cord injuries, they're not curable. So. Telling that to my parents, that was a difficult task, because they changed their whole life after the accident. They changed their jobs. They changed their lives. They searched all over the world to find a cure. And after 15 years of doing so, I couldn't just go up to them and say like, that I didn't want to do it anymore, that I didn't share their dream. Uh, I even had problems discussing disability-regarded obstacles I had to face back then with them at all, because first of all, in the future, I was to walk again anyways. So uh, there was no need for discussing any problems with my disability. And then second, I was ashamed that I was failing them because I wasn't walking. So that led to some complicated situations during puberty, especially. Because you see, not just life changing revelations are happening in puberty. Also, interest in people changes a bit. Or well, let's be more specific sexual interest happens. <laughs> so when I was about 17, and I wanted to start with this exciting part of my life as well, <laughs> I, I had no clue how to do it. Because after all, I was paralyzed from waist down. And <laughs> how do I put this? Uh, 
my body doesn't always work the way I want it to work. <laughs> so I couldn't go to my parents and ask them, like, hey, help me find a solution, because I told you. And, and most of all, it's not the most delicate topic to talk about. So I just went to the family doctor, who has known me since I was like this small, uh, who I always consulted for some problems when I had tennis injuries. And she was very surprised with the different kind of problem I consulted her this time. She was so baffled, she just handed me loads of free samples of Viagra, just telling me, try it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you this because I want to show you how far I've come since then. Because what you don't know is that my parents are sitting in the audience right now as well, listening to, her son talk, to their son talking about Viagra. I mean, <laughs> And my grandparents are here as well, but they don't understand English. So I'm, I'm really happy for that. <laughs> OK, let's get serious one more time. Um, I told you already, I'm not a professional speaker. And when I got approached by 15 seconds months ago, uh, I was thinking, what can I tell you? What do I have to offer? So when I was reflecting about all these stories and problems I was facing, I, was, I just told you about, I realized something, something very important. And if someone two years from now asks you what this talk of this weird wheelchair kid in 15 seconds in Graz was all about, I want you to remember this one thing. And the thing is that I got really lucky. Uh, having a disability here at this place, at that time in history, in this country, with this friends and family, and especially with my brother, uh, with the support, I had to, I could live the life I was living, and I told you about. But also, I had this normal life due to the infrastructure, due to the medical support, due to the society needed for having equal chances or nearly equal chances with a disability as well. But 80% of people with disabilities all around the world live in so called developing countries where requirements for life in the middle of society are often not met at all. So I want to use my final minute here on stage for a call to action, to give this a thought and to eventually support organizations who try to help and better the situation for disabled people all around the world. And so I want to introduce to you today this organization called Light for the World. I don't know, I should have a picture of it at some point, but. Apparently, the picture's not here. <laughs> they are an awesome group of people who are traveling all over the world, who build schools open for everyone, inclusive for everyone, uh, not the ones like in Austria, <laughs> and for creating equal chances for all children all around the world. They provide wheelchairs and prosthesis who are much needed. They provide surgeries for people who can't pay for them, and much, much more. So I want to end this for a call to action, as I told you, to help everyone to get as lucky as I did here, and for everyone to work for a society open for everyone. Thank you. Woo! Woo! I hear lots of like, woo! <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, very much. Thank you for such an open and honest talk, <laughs> um, just about your life, everything that you've gone through and how you think, and for sharing that with us. Um, as the microphones are going down through the audience to ask questions, I do have a question for you. I think your perspective is amazing and the way that you look at the world, but not everybody can look at the world that way. And I'm pretty sure you've probably had some pretty shitty days too, <laughs> where yeah. they just haven't been great. Um, so what kind of advice can you offer people around when you're really struggling and you're, and you're really desperate? How do you approach that? Oh, well, as I told you, I'm not the wise person I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I maybe look like today. But um, I think that I, I told you I got really lucky and I got told to have a very different perspective from a very young age. I kind of just focused on the stuff I was still able to do and maximized that. Uh, that's why I
got probably pretty successful in my sports career as well. Or I want to be more successful, obviously, in the future. But I think it's just that if you look, if you focus on the stuff you can't do, it just brings you down. If you look at the stuff that you can do, it's rise, it helps you rise. I'm going to disagree with one thing you said. I think you're very fortunate to have the people in the life that you do, but I also think you've chosen an incredible attitude all the time. So it's not just luck, it's a lot of choice <laughs> and a lot you. of hard work too. So do we have any questions from the audience out there? And there's also, if you're shy, you know you can use the feedbacker as well. <laughs> and while the well, microphones are walking around, um, I do have some more questions too. So you mentioned Light for the World, um, and you had a chance to talk about that organization when we spoke. One thing we never got a chance to get to is why is that so important to you? Like, why are you so passionate about it? Well, as a tennis player, you get to travel all around the world. And I've seen the good and bad in probably a lot of countries. Uh, we traveled to tournaments in South Africa where they kind of picked the people out of the townships, the former townships, uh, to get to the tournament with disabilities because they were then so happy to then at least get food provided there. And they were so happy to get schools just for disabled people because at least they could get some education, which in our country there's a huge, uh, the discussion goes into a totally different direction. We are actually so much developed that it's like, uh, we don't want to exclude people, but we want to include them in our normal school system. But back then they were so happy that at least they get a school. So that's why I saw very different uh, lives and disabilities all over the world. So I think especially being in a country like Austria, it's kind of our obligation yeah. and our responsibility to shift the attention to people who, who need it more. Amazing. I love that work that you're doing. It's incredible. We've got a question over here. Thank you, Nico. It's probably one of the most genuine and honest conversations I've heard in a long time. So thanks for that. I think uh, you might need to speak just a little bit louder. How's that? Yeah, perfect. That better? Yeah. Perfect. Nico, just a quick question. What, what role do you think sport has in changing those perceptions that you talked about over the past 20 minutes and really fostering a more inclusive society? Uh, yeah, I think the good thing about sports, like disability sport, is that we don't have just this chase for accomplishments, but we also always kind of have the second message we, we take with us. We always also show what people with disabilities are still capable of. So uh, it's kind of a very beautiful movement. I mean, I think uh, sport can't change everything, obviously, but it's a very good tool for see letting people see what we are still capable of doing and also shifting the, the perception of, oh, you're so poor and pity them, but actually for admiration for what they can achieve just for any other sportsman as well. So you talk about, um, you know, kind of that wish or what you can achieve. If you had one wish you could make, what would it be for seeing the way disabilities are today in Austria, but also internationally, say, over the next 20 years? Um, Pretend I'm your magic genie, and if I could wave my wand and grant <laughs> you anything, what would you hope the world would look like 20 years from now? Well, I hope that different, like, uh, abnormalities or stuff that is not the normal way we perceive it now are just being treated as normal as well. So it doesn't always have to be just about disability, but just if yeah. someone has something that doesn't is as it should be, it's just mm -hmm. perceived as normal or it's just open for everyone. I think that's the main thing we should develop too. I love that. And I love that in so many ways because I think in general, as a society, we grow up with these perspectives on what should be. And I think what you've shared with us is just because it's a perception that does not mean it's reality. And we all have those things, right? Yeah. Where there's things that we think we should be this or we should be that, and what is normal? So the more that we can embrace each other and just accept that you know, we're all individual and unique and bring something, I think it's a beautiful message that you're sharing. Thank you. I think we've got another question back there, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you talk about how um, lucky you are in, to live in a country like Austria, but what challenges do you still see for disabled people here and how do you deal with it? Oh yeah, there's loads still, obviously. I mean, uh, growing up, I, didn't, I wasn't in Vienna, I wasn't able, for example, I mean, it sounds pretty basic now after this 
uh, kind of very emotional talk. Uh, but I wasn't able to, to use public transport, for example. I wasn't able to choose the school I wanted to go to. Uh, and even though there is now laws implemented that prohibit a school to decline a, peop a person with disability if they have the capacities, um, uh, I still think there is the obvious obstacles in Austria still to, to face, like making everything really accessible, like making uh, your everyday life accessible in terms of that you can also uh, be part of everyday life in all aspects, that I can go to every cinema, I can go to every uh, mall, I can go to every bar if I want to. Um, and then also, obviously, I think when we m commit more to the society, or if we are more part of society, then people start to change their perspective as well. I think it's like, at first we need to change the physical obvious obstacles to then change the barriers in the mind. But because if we all like, get more in contact with each other, then we get to know that people with disabilities are just people. Okay. Did we have another question over there? Okay, well, I've got some, another question for you. Um, so we were talking last night, and we were talking about the next two days, and you obviously were speaking this morning, which was incredible. Um, what are you hoping to get out of your main, out of time here? And you know, you've shared your story, but I'm wondering if there's anything that this audience might be able to share with you afterwards. Uh, now I have to be very honest. That I was writing or yesterday when we talked, I was still very focused on the speech I was going to do today. And I was writing until one o'clock yesterday. Like, not writing, but like rehearsing and rehearsing. So I was very, until now I was very focused, and now I'm like really relieved to, to have this over, because I told Yay! you, I'm not used to this. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think you. you did a really thank good you. job, an amazing um, job. Thank you. So I think that, to me, sounds like an invite for anybody in this room to grab a drink with you or a cup oh, of yes. coffee now afterwards, right? Oh, look at his eyes. Now yeah, I'm party. I want to be able now to I'm have a party drink. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, congratulations on a great talk. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your sharing your story. Um, and I know you're going to be around for the next two days. So if anybody else has any other questions, you know, feel free yes. to come meet Nico and talk to him. And again, Excellent. thank you for sharing your amazing story. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.